So today I'm going to be talking to Ravi Sawney. Ravi, good to see you. Been good a long time. You. How are you? You all right? Yes, thank you. Yes, it's been a while. <laughs> it has been a bit a while, yeah. So look, traditional first question is, what do you do? Um, well, I still work a little bit um, as a, a sort of computer programmer, but that's down to a couple of days a week now, so... Mostly I play my, my musical instruments, my yes. various musical instruments. <laughs> yeah, um, now that's, that's obviously what I'm particularly interested in, actually. So, yeah. so tell me a little bit about, about, you know, about, you know, your early, early life. Early life. Um, yes. Well, um, yeah. Um, I was, I was born in India. Um, my mother was English. My father was an Indian naval officer. Um, and uh, we moved to England when I was about one. And then back to India when I was about three and a half. Um, musically speaking, I, I lived in a, in a very large extended family. So there were a lot of people who were interested in in various bits and pieces of music. My mum was a classically trained sort of concert level pianist. Um, mm. But she, uh, she had great difficulty finding any pianos that that were in tune in India that what with the, the, the climate being what it was and the resources being kind of limited. So uh, they were rare. And I remember <laughs> one thing she said to me, she just recently died, by the way, which is uh, mm -hmm. why she figures in my thinking quite a lot at the moment. Um, she, I remember her telling me that she was absolutely chuffed one day when she realised she'd lost her sense of perfect pitch. Because... Right. That's, a, <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> because instead of it being torture, every time she came near a piano, she could at least maybe play it, even if it was a, yeah, yeah, yeah. A, at a different kind of level. Yeah, but yeah. she was quite keen, possibly too keen, to get me to play the piano, um, and it didn't work out great, you know. Um, uh, and I decided, no, I'll play the guitar. <laughs> <laughs> so, when, so <laughs> did, were you sort of like? Well, did she teach you, or did you? Well, she, you know, the she did the teach piano? Me. She was a piano teacher at. Yeah, the, at the school that I went to. So um, it was like right up her street. Hmm. Um, but I can't remember. I remember some daft piece of music that um, at, at grade one that I learned. And it was like really kind of easy. I probably learned it in two minutes or something. Most of it was like, how do you move your fingers? But then we did a little performance in which I did my ding 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 like playing twinkle twinkle little star on a on a fiddle and my mum did this kind of massive great like accompaniment yeah, yeah. oh no 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 <laughs> this is this is a bit of a fraud yeah. Yeah, yeah um yeah. yeah but I saved up my money for a year and got a cheap guitar which was great lovely so what age was this then that you started playing guitar Oh, I was about 10, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, and uh, at that time, I'm trying to remember when that was. That was the moon landings year. Oh. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and so that's the kind of music that was hanging around the time. But I was, I, I, when I started, I actually learned, learned to play kind of Indian style. And that's a sort of... Uh, it's not your regular guitar. It's like a Hawaiian guitar with a blue yeah. ball. And yeah, you yeah, yeah. Literally, just did this, you know. Yeah. Um. 
and um but uh, you know that didn't kind of like sit too well with me because it wasn't cool enough you know um yeah yeah so uh, hang on this phone's asked me a stupid question um all right yeah um i hope i don't run out of power on that but if i do i've got a charger um right okay yeah so um but it was great it was a it was a great introduction and even now i still remember the things i got up to at the age mm. of 10 with this slidey guitar and it gives me a mm. lot of insight into indian music mm. um many many years later mm. um yeah but then now uh, my mum moved school and um i bought another guitar that's the first one i bought the one i was at learning the Indian stuff on was given to me and this was a regular guitar and it was a question of you had absolutely no resources growing up in India you just you had the radio and there was a couple of radio stations that played western stuff we didn't have a stereo um and it was a question of like well what can you come up with um and for some reason there were a um, this was a boarding school, so some of the kids had like uh, a couple of EPs by the Beatles with Please Please Me and I Want to Hold Your Hand. <laughs> and that was great. That was, uh... And um, my mum sort of at this point kind of accepted that I might not be playing the piano anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so she, um, so she bought me, a, I think, she bought me the sheet music for a couple of things. One one strange Spanish song called Amour, which was um, um, which taught me some new chords. You know, it had mm. new patterns, um, and a couple of Beatles tracks, which she managed to get hold of um, the sheet music for. But after that, it was just literally what what they're doing, you know, what are they doing? And uh, mm. sit there trying to work it out. And mm. I, I remember that was when Inner Visions came out. Right. And, oh, that blew my mind, that did. I bet it did. <laughs> I haven't recovered. <laughs> no. No. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, that was how it all kicked off, you know. Mm. Mm. So, so you, you're still in India at this point, aren't you? Yeah, I'm, I was in India until I was 17. And um, the only reason we all came back was because my dad died in an accident. Oh, um, okay. And it left my mum feeling a little bit vulnerable in a strange country. And um, although by then she'd lived there for 14 years, so it wasn't that strange. And she had a lot of relatives if she'd wanted to go. Um, the, thing, the thing was, our rallies were was sort of relatively posh and so they lived their life of uh, their preferred life which was fairly indolent you didn't do much you know you just literally hung about and and didn't do much you played cards in the evening you went out you went on safaris you know that kind of that's what you did mm. and it just did not suit my mum and um um yeah sorry this picture keeps coming up on your recording it'll keep coming up on your recording you won't see me unless you change <laughs> what you're recording. No, it, it might be because it's flashing between the two, two yeah things. So if, you, if you pop me on uh you know what's that no, that's all right I'm, I'm we should be all right actually okay then I'm, i've got it on gallery so oh that's all right um cool um yeah so uh no that just carried on and it was a little bit like there was a school band, you know, like, and there, there was, uh, there's another chap and we used to play. I remember we played uh, Locomotive Breath. <laughs> yeah, you remember that? <laughs> mm, I do. Yeah. <laughs> that riff. Da, 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 da. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In a da, 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 the Locomotive Breath. Bah, 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 bah. That was cool. Um. It's only when I got to England I realised that how uncool um, it was. <laughs> so, when, so when you when you come back to England, then so suddenly, I mean, 
what 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 sort of year are we looking at? The period of time when you're back in England? 76, 77. Yeah. Right. So did you did you suddenly was it a bit of a bit of a sort of a musical culture shock where you know because obviously there's quite a lot was available by 76, 77. Lots of things were happening in England. Well, by then um in India I'd kind of encountered well for years Pink Floyd uh, a few American bands like you know the the rocky kind of bands um the kinks the beatles the stones i mean there was just there was just a lot going on but the, but the um i don't know how to put it there wasn't much of a like a scene with bands because there just weren't any bands did not travel to india to do concerts and if no, no, you, did, you, you couldn't like afford it so um <clears throat> so most of the live music was in hotels and it was like jazz um and there were some young singer songwriter style groups doing Crosby Stills Nash and Young that kind of stuff yeah um it was, it was it was okay but when I got to England and I was living in Somerset and I went to Yeovil Tech met a few people and that's that, that's when I kind of realized the kind of full spectrum and the first yeah. band I was asked to get involved with was a was a kind of punk band and they were they were really loud. I mean, <laughs> but uh, I I, don't, I shudder to say this, but I think loud was the point, and very little else. Yes. Yeah. Um, but not that that not. I mean, I really love a lot of the bands, and I, I love Sham Sixty Nine, The Jam. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, they were they were good. Um, but I, I found it very hard to slot into. Is that what you meant about the culture shock? Yes, yeah, because you know, because th there is obviously a a sort of a theme amongst a lot of the people that I, I I've interviewed where there's a limit, a limitation to what's available. Because obviously nowadays you can just get access to just about anything, but going back in time you didn't, and and obviously you what you're saying is quite. An extreme level of that, if you're interested in a particular st style of music. I mean, it, it, you know, you're saying it's difficult to get material in the Beatles or whatever. Yeah. And, and and then, of course, by the time you get to the UK, there's more stuff available. But it's still, you know, there's obviously things on TV and, oh, and gosh, stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. You know, and and, and it's, it's sort of like... Um, I just because it, that would have been such a sudden switch for you going from coming from India to to the UK. I was just w wondering what you how that sort of um, made you feel. You know. About. Okay, that's that's cool. Yeah, I mean, in my last year in India, I remember. God, this is a the, my dad's contribution to all this because he was uh, he's quite a high up in the navy, and he used to he ran this grand workshop which repaired uh the airplanes that were part of the indian navy and he offered me one year to have a guitar built for me in this workshop right. now the only problem was <laughs> these fellas had never built a guitar right no um and when it came to doing the pickups there was this somebody got this idea oh no we're gonna wrap the pickups we're going to make these pickups out of like you know from scratch <laughs> and and get these magnets and make this so the pickups were were fine but they weren't great <laughs> so i remember in the last year i wrote my mum a letter saying look can i can i spend some of me uh, <laughs> grant money not grant except it's all it's all paid for by my mum who had a little bit of money by then um because my dad had died and um said you know can i buy uh pickups for my guitar and she wrote me this like uh very kind of serious letter saying you're there to study mate you're not there to play guitar so can we can we put this on the back burner for a while um and that didn't didn't go down very well with me but um but i had still got my uh my guitar which was uh lovely and shiny and 
purple. No, it wasn't purple. No, it was a kind of dark red with black and oh, it looked fabulous. Um, it just needed new pickups. No, without the new pickups, the, the, oh, without... they kind of worked. They were all right. They they were just like you know the G was really loud and the yeah 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 no, 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 you know all no, that no. kind of bullshit. Yeah 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 because um, that used to be something. I mean, there used to be a range of guitars that Woolworths used to sell. <laughs> really <laughs> called, called yeah called audition right and um there was an amp an audition amp that took like a miniature stack but it was sort of basically a almost a hollow box with a rather poor speaker in um and this sort of head part that was again mostly nothing just with a little bit of electronics but a lot of people had that because hmm. it's the only thing we could afford but the pickups on the guitars were like that, where one of the strings would be much louder than the others. Yeah, cool. And uh, I do remember that. I think you are right. It's either the D or the G was much louder than it should have been. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so it's obviously a yeah, obviously a bit of a des design fault. But um, yeah. but I it was there was a I think the culture shock on the musical side was that actually I was surrounded by. All right. At one end, we had the sort of the punk bands, and they were cool. Um, I remember discussing with someone, you know, I thought I kind of want to be in a band, and this bless her, um, she says, "Oh, we don't have any reggae bands around here." <laughs> Just a, okay, <laughs> fine. <laughs> um, and uh, so there you go, uh, but. That was just one thing. At the college itself, there was a big music department and they did productions and there were some amazing guitarists and piano players, jazz. There was, there was someone who I, I really cannot work out why he's not a world famous like guitarist now, but he was there and he, um, he, he was, he knew, knew all these kind of amazing chords. I'd actually managed to get hold of a book, which I, I've lost now, and I really wish I could find it. But it just said jazz guitar, and it was black and yellow, and it was it had a couple hundred pages maybe. Um, and on the very first page, there's a grid of guitar chords, and I kid you not, it was about twelve across and six down, all the chords. Um, you know the flat fifths, the, you know, the flat tenths, everything. In one say and say, well, this is your first exercise. Go just work through this, learn all these shapes. And then the rest of the book was really subtle stuff about, you know, vamping and and solo runs and oh, it was it it was not a beginner's book. And mm -hmm. it it didn't do me much good. But now I really wish I had it and I can't find it anywhere. Have you any any ideas? <laughs> well, no, I mean there used to be a lot of books like that um you know like the sort of ten thousand guitar chords and and you know the um berkeley um right right college courses and yeah. and there'd be like three or four um three or four volumes of that uh but the um there are a lot of um there are a lot of uh those early guitar books which you know they don't they don't seem Mickey to be Baker printed. wrote it just Mickey Baker, to you, yeah, yeah, it yeah, brought, yeah. It's brought it back to me. Yeah, Mickey Baker, yeah, yeah, the Mickey Baker book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Blimey. There was, I think it's actually, so well done. Um, yeah, so there's a lot, it's interesting this, isn't it? Because th th a lot of those books, they, they were, if you looked at them now, you think, ah, not very good because they're not, you know, because obviously things have got quite, quite sort of organised and complex about how, you know, how, how the way that certainly things like jazz is taught, you know, yeah. but I think, I think with the, a lot of those, a lot of those, uh, those early books, I think they were not so structured. So, you know, to start off with just all these chords, just learn these type mm. of thing. Um, it's like, you know, it's almost like a knockout blowing on page <laughs> one, isn't it? But, um, so, so what I'm sort of interested in is obviously how, your because your musical style is obviously not punk and it's not Indian music, and you, you, you know, you were the first person I ever met who, who played at Hurdy Gurdy. So <laughs> there's there's a lot of stuff here that, that um, yeah, 
<clears throat> you got involved in. So what 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 happened then from there? You've you're at college. You've been sort of messed around in a few punk bands. And... Well, I, yeah, uh, I I played in the college productions, learned a few things, but it was kind of like it was more of a culture shock for the other people, you know, playing with me and trying trying to sing with me and kind of going, oh my god, you know. Um, um, I kind of then found a couple of people that I were quite happy to sing songs with, you know, like yeah, yeah, standards or whatever, yeah. and that carried on for years and years um, until. For Sorry, some hang on it. Yeah, it's all right. There's, keep talking. There's a lot of conversation <laughs> going on outside. So. All right. For some right, reason, um, I mean, I, I, I kind of started to grow out of it a bit you know it was sort of yeah it felt a little bit like yeah that was you that was yeah. a moment in time yeah um and i got to on my 30th birthday a friend of mine who i'd played with at at uh, at college and he mm. was at college he was he'd come from the kind of classically trained fiddle player but had no confidence in his abilities um, and we used to do some very strange stuff. We used to just like um, improvise out of nothing. Mm. Um, and I'd be on on a guitar, and he'd be on uh, on a piano. And we would, and people would come and listen to us, and they say, "Well, why were you all playing different tunes? <laughs> like, why was he playing one tune?" And well, anyway, he was my uh, friend. I still know him. I still go and I still play with him. On my thirtieth birthday, he bought me a violin. Now ah. that, that was it. That was uh, that was um, bought me a violin. Well, actually, he just gave me, loaned me a violin. Unfortunately, I haven't given it back yet, and I'm sixty-two now. So um, <laughs> he does kind of look at it longingly from time to time. Yeah. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So uh, and bit by bit, I I learned a few things. And he used to go to sessions and play Irish music. Ah um your you know your folk uh mm. and i think he was pretty good at it but it's not your it's not music for a beginner do you know what i mean it's, it's yeah no absolutely it's, it's pretty full on from the beginning yeah, is, yeah. you know yeah yeah it's um totally good. so uh it it i kind of didn't take to that i i actually joined for the sake of my fiddle, I joined something called the East London Late Starters Orchestra. Right. Um, Does that mean to say when the conductor taps his bat on, everybody starts later than it, it you know? No, well, no there's, there's, there's a few jokes like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, but, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, <go laughs> well, it was a fabulous organisation. When I think back to it, I think, Blimey, there should be hundreds of those now, but there aren't. Yeah. No, Basically, no, what had happened was that th there was uh, all the parents of kids who mm. were doing Saturday music mm. with their fiddles, their cornet or whatever, you know, um, mm. they found themselves stuck in this school with not a lot to do mm. for a couple of hours whilst this all went on. So they said, why, why don't we have our own, like, group? Um and they took that seriously. And by the time I got there, it was pretty well organized. They had four tutors. If you, you could just walk in off the street and you'd be given a violin or a viola or whatever you wanted, whatever, if you had any previous experience or if you brought your own one, great. Um, and right from the first week, you'd be given a par that was suitable to your, your level. So like, the third violin might just have like an occasional open string to play. But the idea was that you were in a group of 30 people straight away. Yeah. And the f it, it felt amazing. You know, didn't matter what rubbish you, you were actually able to play. You were a part of that thing. And it was amazing. Um, and that I carried on with that for a couple of years. Um, um, in the meantime, I was, of course, listening to stuff. My friend Daniel had at that point suddenly got into French music, French folk music, because of a rather strange... Um, he lived in Norwich, and Norwich 
There was a chap called uh, Cliff Stapleton who who rented a room off him, played hurdy gurdy, and uh, probably one of the best hurdy gurdy players I know of. I mean, mm -hmm. we're talking twenty years, thirty years ago. Um, I only knew. I mean, there were a lot of hurdy gurdy players around, but the, right. the really good ones. There was a band called Blows a Bella, which you may have heard of. They did a sort of um a repertoire of english and french folk music and uh, they were actually quite instrumental in reviving the french folk scene yes um many many years ago and so if you go to france now for example <laughs> everybody knows these blows of bella tunes it's crazy um but uh, cliff was there living with daniel and gave daniel a couple of lessons daniel ended up playing the hurdy-gurdy and when i visited him he was playing up a tune or two and i i thought oh i can i can i can get this and it was the first like time i think i realized that actually folk music is really quite accessible that the tunes mm. although they sound amazing mm. they're, they're they're quite short really and you mm -hmm. know it's within the grasp of a um ordinary person like like me to to to, to partake you know uh, have a go at and um so uh, possibly for no other reason than it was slightly easier for me to do i started playing french music but then there's one it's one of these weird coincidences my mother yes. had bought uh a record uh by kirita kanawa the new zealand opera singer, uh, opera singer. Yeah. anyway and and she was she just wanted to buy kiri tekanawa uh, and put her on the record player but the record that she ended up with was something called chance d'auvergne songs of auvergne by a chap called Conteloup. um mm. and now Conteloup was like cecil sharp is in this country but much more mm. recent mm. and he had gone around collecting songs and it was yeah I mean, it's probably not unfair to say that um, he was a little bit associated with the Vichy uh, regime, so he's not very popular in France, even at, in his own time. Um, but he did open a door for me. And I suddenly found that actually of all the tunes that Daniel was playing, the ones that really resonated with me were the fiddle tunes from Auvergne. Mm. And so I, I kind of got into that uh, I bought a couple of tapes in those days it was cassettes listened to them until they fell apart um, and think about cassettes and they all fell apart because what would I do I'd play it and then I go press the rewind button and go ee! and then it would take me back and listen to that same bit again yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> to destruction <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. until I knew what they were doing um, this was before CDs so um, yeah yeah, yeah and um so t tell me about this weird thing about the, the, she went to buy a, 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 a your mother went to buy a recording by tura Takanawa and ended up with the songs of the Auvergne. i mean how did that work well it was did, kiri was kiri singing them oh right okay i got you got you yeah, yeah no she she um it was she just went into the shop and said can i have a record yeah. and they said the only one we've got is this contelope right okay yeah, yeah, yeah. and mm -hmm. It's a classic. I mean, if you it if is you, a classic album. I remember that that was that was a you know a big a big selling classical album of the period, yeah. isn't it? And it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's 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 the the thing about it is it's not like your regular opera. You know, it's like, it's a kind of bizarre. Um, and um, if I look if I listen to it now, I think, oh my god, what have they done? It's a little bit. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Over orchestrated yeah. and a little bit kind of no, and then you compare it to the <laughs> the other work I've done, which is looking at um, recordings of uh, French people made in the eighties singing and playing this stuff, and it is so rough and kind of full of power. Um, it puts the contelope to shame, but it it had set my head up. And mm. another strange thing about it was that the modalities that they used were very yes. like Indian music. Yes, I was uh, there. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. 
so let's talk about that then so what sort of is it sort of dorian mixolydian type so it's yeah it... mix mixolydian is the most noticeable one but mm. it's worse than that um <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go on, then. it's uh, the uh, there isn't quite the same like respect um for the well-tempered scale yes yeah yeah um amongst especially amongst fiddle players in the urban mm. that were recorded and consistently you had like the seventh would be like very sharp but not quite sharp enough to be the next note and the third would be somewhere between and also they had this tendency that it wasn't necessarily the same pitch every time mm. the note occurred it, it depended on the phrase it, it occurred in and stuff like this yeah and yeah. that's very very that's very indian mm. yeah and um although in in indian music you have no names to notes that correspond to sharp and flat and stuff yes um and you have um oh, it's um can i do a brief <laughs> talk yes, about how indian music yes, works. yes you do do definitely <laughs> yeah all right don't don't quote me on this but what what little i know it comes from you always i don't know if you've ever seen like uh an indian uh, uh music being performed there's usually like someone who's playing a melody instrument and there's someone who's playing uh tabla or dolak something like that yeah yeah um and then there's someone else who yeah. doesn't seem to be doing anything but yeah like a big shooting and, box or something yeah, yeah. All, all the, and nowadays they get replaced totally by a shooting box yeah, which yeah, is yeah. horrible but no uh it's uh one less mouth to feed but there you go um and this person would be playing the this sort of uh basically a, a c sus chord oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah yeah the whole time and it's like this would just be going on and on and on and on and that's cool if you're in c mm. but the, the 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 first departure rag goes into f and so you start introducing b flat but the drone does not change mm. it remains it's it's still in c then you might be you might might go from f you might go to b flat and now you've got an e flat but it's mm. still c mm. the drone but and you get further and further apart it starts to make less sense as a picture you know it starts stops being like modal like you might be used to yes um and becomes well all right how do you cope with the fact that there are some real massive dissonances in this rag and you add so you might have a rag which has like three consecutive semitones <laughs> right and but you won't use it you won't use all the notes all the time. You just, you're just free to use those notes, and mm. it goes like that. Um, and it's a, it's a ni nice little way in to to listening to Indian music. Um, but anyway, it set my brain up for really latching onto it. And um, so there you go. Does that? Uh, does yeah, that no, that's, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. So because I think one of the things that we we have a problem with in sort of modern Western thinking is that because of the well-tempered scale is that a lot of, a lot of cultures and a lot of, a lot of places that's so recent. Well, it is so recent anyway, but it took a long time for that to catch on in other places, you know, to, to have a fixed thing. And in some cultures, and it's just true of Arabic music, some of the pitches of the notes aren't what we would necessarily recognize anyway. Mm -hmm. you know um and um so you know if ever you know and i sort of dipped into indian music and arabic music a bit and you always have to sort of sort of guess you know or make use of what you hear in such a way that you can bring it back because you know i'm not going to be playing indian music um yeah so you end up taking something with it and yeah. it's not really it's not really from that culture anymore but yeah. So, to, so when you're talking about the, the sort of folk music, the French folk music, um, and the fact that you know, obviously, this would have been true, particularly if somebody's playing a violin. If they're playing a fiddle, they can pitch a note anyway, can't they? It's not like they're playing a, the accordion. 
type of thing where, you know, they're, they are your notes. Um, so how does that, how does that work with the, um, the hurdy-gurdy then? So, because oh, you've got keys yeah. on that, haven't you? Well, the hurdy-gurdy, um, uh, hang on, I'm just going to draw the curtain and I'm, then I'm going to get myself a drink. Dirty player. Oh, did you pause so, it? Oh, sorry. Yeah, so that, so that again, Chris, Chris, Cliff, saying about Chris, Cliff, Cliff Stapleton, Nigel Eaton. Yeah. yeah. Um. Well, for me, this thing, which of noticing French music and being able to play it on my fiddle, was like the beginning of an explosion. Um. It turned out that while I was living in London and there was in London, a French club called En Bouge, which still exists with, with that name, different people run it about, and they would meet every Wednesday evening and we would uh, play a few tunes and um, uh, learn a couple of dances, you know, whatever. And I suddenly, um, I, yeah, I, I suddenly f developed a passion for the whole like package of being able to just show up uh, with your acoustic instrument, no messing. You just sit down there. You might be by yourself. You might have someone with you, um, and you just play this, 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 these tunes that you kind of learned that morning. And if you play them even vaguely right, people are loving it. They, they're just having a dance, and it's, it's the, it's. You suddenly realise that music isn't necessarily about having the best guitar, or oh, absolutely, yeah, you know, I totally agree with you. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. See, this is something that I have been sort of fascinated by for quite some time. We have this idea, you know, somebody says what makes a great band or what makes a great piece of music. You'll list a series of things which actually are not that relevant, you know, like as you say, the best guitarist, the best drummer and all that, because it's about a chemistry thing. But it's not just about a chemistry within, within the band. You know, it's also a chemistry with an audience. Hmm. And what you're expressing there is, is exactly that thing, isn't it? Which is you're playing, and, and even if it's vaguely right, people can be enjoying it yeah. and, and, and dancing. And that's the point about yeah. it. And once that you connect with that, I think that is a very different place. Because I, I, where, where I, where I am on this type of thinking at the moment is I think this, you can see that in early, early rock bands. It's certainly the case in bands like the Stones, you know, and the Beatles. Whereas it's about the chemistry of the, of the, the band. Not, not so much about you know who's. The best player or, or anything like that um and that sort of has got a bit lost i think um, it might have been the case in punk to some extent i would say but certainly early rock and roll I mean, they, they certainly weren't the best players yeah um, <clears throat> you know so going back to this thing you, 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 you know going to this sort of club or whatever playing playing stuff when did you get to the point where in yourself you thought this is definitely something like I really resonate with? Is this like really early on or was there a while before you? Well, it's, it's kind of, there was a, it's a tricky one because it just seems to be like a succession of, a sex i mean when i first got involved i couldn't believe how enthusiastic i was about it but then two years later i couldn't believe how enthusiastic about it i was then and then five years after that i was on another level of involvement and then 10 years after that i was it was just like it just incessant you know it just got more and more and more powerful and now now it's basically all I do, you know, is, you know, work at this, that, the other idea or whatever, get better at your instrument. 
Um, I spent this year having, after the kind of COVID break, but even during COVID, I went to France, France for a week. That was scary. I went to France for a week to work with the particular accordion player that I was interested in. I know we've kind of missed out the hurdy gurdy. This isn't right. No, 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 no. We've got to no, we'll back. come back to that. Keep, keep, carry on where, where you are. We'll come back to the hurdy gurdy. So and even that was in the first year of lockdown. I went there. And me and Heather went, and um, it was oh wow, uh, a whole new attitude to to playing the accordion. Um, the next year, I went for three weeks, um, which was again. This was still COVID. And then this year, there were no restrictions. I went for eight. And I went around loads of festivals, w watched loads of bands, slept in a tent, did, did three weeks of uh, work with different musicians, um, attended a few like one-off day courses and stuff like that. Finally, got to know my violin heroes who kicked me off in this direction, the two members of Trio Violon, um, one of whom plays an accordion now. <laughs> yes. Um, and the other one makes the most fabulous violins that I've ever come across, but they're out of my league, I'm afraid. But there you go. Um, so, the, 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 so, and now it's, it's, now it's kind of turned around. It's sort of, I'm, I'm, I kind of now I think I've found something which is extraordinary. It's just like um, it's it's got an identity of its own. It's got a life of its own, and I'm just kind of like peripheral to it. It's this this world of this this music and how it all fits together and who knows who and and all this stuff. And um, it's 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 kind of now I want to I'm I'm sitting there thinking. Like, what can I do with this? And okay, I'm 60 odd, but I reckon <laughs> I still got a chance <laughs> to yeah, absolutely. make something of absolutely. it. Absolutely. No. Well, uh, I'm glad yeah. you think that because I think the same thing. Um, no, I'm, I, I think this, this is fascinating. The, you know, being sort of sucked into, um, in, in this case, like a, a, um, let's say it's a style for mm. want of a better word. But you realise the thing itself is a thing. Um, yeah. And um, it's obviously fed by the enthusiasm of people to play it, but it seems to have its own way of being. And um, I certainly think that about music generally anyway, but um, instead of it being some sort of commodity, you know, this is something I've always felt was problematic. Let's. I just want to ask you one thing. Um, when you met up with the these this accordion player, that's you know presumably somebody that's let's say revered for want of a word. Oh, I haven't mentioned any revered accordion players yet. <laughs> no, but let's. What was it that struck you about the why the way it was being played that you okay. that you the, learnt from it? The Oh, of course, yes, I did mention. Um, well, all right, the uh, me, I'm a fiddle player. Uh, but going back many years, I, I suddenly, I, I felt that no, hang on, somehow, fiddle kind of just scratches the surface of that little bit of the music. Mm. Um, and if I kind of just just played fiddle, I was wasn't going to play enough in this country, there just wasn't enough going on. Um, so for some reason I was at a festival, I was booked, I was playing with a friend of mine who was playing a hurdy-gurdy and I was playing fiddle, um, and we sat and played and, uh, I noticed this advert for a hurdy-gurdy and by then I'd had a go at a couple of, I'd had a go at Daniel's and, um, I'd had a go at other people's, um, and so I, on this kind of moment of madness because it was three and a half grand. Yes, they're not cheap, are they? Yeah. Um, I just sort of thought, sod it. Um, 
And I comforted myself by saying, well, I could sell it next week for approximately the same price. You know? <laughs> yeah. So it's not really spending the money. And uh, But I, I got hold of it and, you know, tried to get on with it. And I did. And it's, it's, it's one of those... Um, um, it's a machine. It's a, it's a melody instrument, but it, it it's like the bagpipes. You've got a drone, and everything is played a, against that drone. So you're you're way into the modalities and what works and you know what doesn't work. And oh, it's fabulous. And um, the the it's a it's very much an instrument that in its uh, in 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 you know in. Uh, I nearly said in real true life, um, but in in its in its historical context, you you got your your musicians who wandered around in France and you know played, and it was it was a great one person instrument because it had a little rhythm section built into it uh, called the trumpet, and it was loud, and it had the drone and you could play these, it had the keyboard two octave keyboard probably works for about octave and a half. And then it gets a bit squeaky, but um, it was very self-contained, and that's where I, I wanted to take that step towards being more self-contained. A fiddle, I was, I thought, fine, but I just was not good enough uh, to hold an audience as a solo fiddle player. It just wasn't happening. Um, and with Hurdy Gurdy, it was more feasible, um, possibly because of its rarity value. You. Mm. you you know, um, and then a few years later, I bought another instrument called a nickel harper, um, which I play regularly now. It's a Swedish fiddle, um, but it's got keys like the hurdy gurdy instead of uh, fretted. I mean, instead of um, a keyboard which you stick your finger on. So it's uh, it's a tuned instrument, but it comes with. 12 sympathetic strings so it's like got its own uh reverb yeah um and um swedish music is has a lot of what they call blue notes they call them yeah. blue and it's just out of tune notes which are tuned very specifically for the tune that you're playing and they're not um and you can just about get them on a nickel harper by bending um stuff like that but um accordions i mean if you wander around are you, do you live near brighton no sort of yeah sort well of. well no, i think no. <laughs> you occasionally see morris dancers don't you mm. Mm. and um, there's a little band there's usually an accordionist there's usually a fiddle player there might be a drummer um you know there, there might be a collection of different instruments, but that's the, the sound of a Morris band is very, very quintessentially English, and it's, uh, it's a very particular sound. Um, and um, I love it, but it's it's kind of its possibilities are um, they're not they're not limited, but the the most of the people who play that then say oh yeah but you can be a lot more subtle and you learn these other techniques and whatever and there's people that i can um i don't know if you've ever heard of a person called andy cutting yes uh he's uh he used to be in blows a bella he played a lot of morris stuff and he joined mm -hmm. blows belly when he's when he was 18 he then worked with a fiddle player called chris wood who was also very influential mm -hmm. on my formative years as well and um his his approach to the accordion is english but taken to a a level that as far as i can tell he's the only person who's who's who plays like that or at that time yeah um and you asked me specifically what was it about the, the french accordion player um that was different one thing about him was he really worshipped Andy Cutting. All <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. Um, That's we actually, 
I was there for five days, and one of the days we studied Andy Cutting's technique in the middle of France with lots of really good French accordion players being taught by someone who's a really good French accordion player. No, no, you've got to learn how to do this. <laughs> That's amazing. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And, mm. Um, but no, it was for him, for this particular accordion player anyway, um, there's a there's a degree of precision that he brings to his playing, which gave me because I by then borrowed an accordion, I was kind of farting around with it. Um, um, gave me the idea that uh, there was something that you could aim for. It wasn't just yeah. a matter of yeah, yeah. belting out the next tune, belting out, yeah, yeah. getting your repertoire like, oh, I know two thousand tunes. No not that it's it was it was like now hang on you can just take one tune and just play it in 50 different ways and mm. bring out this aspect bring out that aspect and and it was that was a real eye-opener for me because until then i would have thought of uh accordion playing as well no you you learn the tough you you sit down in front of the audience you you play it the right way and it'll all work and kind of that works and there's nothing no i mean that not that not just does that work it actually works very well and that is a very acceptable thing but what what aurelian was teaching me was that you can go a lot further even even if all you do is um change what you're doing just a little bit so that you've got two ways of doing the same thing mm. a little bit and it it's just sort of it opens up your the way you think about um the music as in it's now not just me and the tune and the instrument it's me the tune and the instrument and whatever else is going on around you yeah that can influence like what you might do yeah. Um, so if it's uh if you so if you're in the field and um it's kind of tranquil you let that come into your playing but not just at the level of oh i'm not going to make i'm not going to pull so hard but what can i do to soften soften the harmonies or and he suddenly it just opens up this whole like amazing new like way of going about it and i haven't got there yet don't get me wrong I, i'm still working on it but um and the strangest thing was that that connected right round to jazz yeah. it just it's just like suddenly i thought hang on a minute well he he, he just played a flat tenth there <laughs> he just did um a minor seventh with a flat fifth <laughs> and i said well why'd you do that and he says oh well um and i said well his, he said well, it's, it sounds nice and i said well is it, have you studied jazz or something he says well actually he says yes i have <laughs> so it wasn't it wasn't accidental but um he was suggesting that actually the, the the melodian i don't know oh i'm going to become very nerdy now no come melodian far melodian. away melodian melodian is like a special kind of accordion mm. which in which you put your finger on a button and if you squeeze the bellows you get one note if you pull them you get a different note mm. so when you when you learn it you, <laughs> you're not just learning which button makes which noise um it's which direction and oh and it's this whole it's uh, it's completely crazy um but the thing about a melodian in that um format is that it's almost impossible to play a wrong note so long as you're pushing or pulling in the correct way so if you want to explore you just like put more fingers out <laughs> and it doesn't right. go wrong right because the 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 way it's designed it's just it manages somehow miraculously to sound great um and um 
Yeah, but it's also a pitfall, and people try very hard to avoid that because it's it's kind of like being lazy and not learning the tune properly. So, whatever. But <laughs> <laughs> the no, but he he, he was saying the mel melodian just provides you with all this sort of scope, and then um, um, you've got your bass end on a melodian, which goes boom, pop, pop, boom, pop, pop. But it doesn't have to. You can do other stuff, and and there you go. Mm. Yeah. So let's talk, you know, because you you you're playing quite a lot, aren't you? With different different people. What's what's what are you doing at the moment? Or is it just that you you know, have you got somebody that you work with a lot? Well, I work with um, as it happens, uh, on Sunday I was working with uh, a melodian player called Anna Pack that I've known for about 20 25 years. And over the years, when I first knew her, she was didn't play any anything folky, but she's become, I think, excellent on the melodeon. Um, I really love playing with her. And um, she and I did a dance on Sunday night. Sunday afternoon is a tea dance. Uh, that was great fun. Um, and um, my partner, Heather, and her friend Jane, we have a little trio and we're playing next weekend, next Sunday for another tea dance in Oxford this time. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting because it, it's, I played with Kaylee bands and I've played in, in bands myself where essentially what the aim seems to be, and it's a laudable aim, absolutely brilliant. You play the tune, everyone plays the tune. The dancers are doing a dance, all they need is they need the beat to be right, they need the tune to be there, and they need it to be entertaining. Um, and that's, that's great. But with this, with, with my, with the people I'm working with now, I'm trying to take it a bit further and it's not it's not nothing radical about it Pe other people have done it it's just i've never quite kind of understood what they were doing <laughs> and but so it's so we're kind of just like loosening the the leash a little bit and saying well all right we'll play the tune six times or whatever so that they can dance it but say the fourth and fifth time we're going to do something completely outrageous and and then people say well what do you want us to do ravi and i say well, it's up to you <laughs> and and stuff like that. And and so it's it's kind of I don't know. It's suddenly um it feeds into the, the, the sort of circle round back to jazz and um and the fact that these days you get two kinds of folk dance in, on the continent. Well two loads of different kinds but there's one called balfog which is um uh very modern um and then there's the other called trad baltrad which is more kind of like how how it used to be and people trying to invent stuff but they they have their their merits and they attract different kinds of players and they attract different kinds of um uh dancers as well and um what strikes me about it all um is that as a as a th whoops sorry someone's trying to contact me sorry, sorry. I'll, I'll i'll reject the call Okay. Um, <clears throat> what was I saying? Um, different different types of dance. So yeah. you had a trad, the trad style. Yeah, the trad and the bal folk and and whatever. But the, the the thing that unifies them and the thing that I find fascinating is um, is that dancing just seems to make people feel better about. Yes. You know. Yes, I think that's absolutely right. Yeah. And uh, so if if all I do for the rest of my life is is play for dancing and get try and get 
you know, clubs going. And, and it's not about, um, it's, 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 it's just literally anything I can do, even if I, even if I, if I can find a contact and go and play in, in an old people's home or something, except that I need to find the right music for that. You know? I mean, that is not my style. Um, but, um, and I mean, I think, for example, that dancing should be prescribed on the NHS, you know? So, yes, totally. <laughs> it should be a yes. thing. <laughs> it should be a thing. It should be a thing. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Um, so in my little way, I'm, I, I'm just trying to spread the word, I suppose, is, you know, I, I, I mean, for instance, next weekend, I'm going, it's a promotional thing. We've got four bands lined up and um the the it's the bands will all do about 40 45 minutes each so that's what's that three hours of actual band before the whole thing starts there's an hour of workshop where people get to learn how to do the dances if they're if it's new to them they're not uh the big difference between say bal folk and trad folk and english kaylee dancing which you've which is also great yeah, is that English Kaylee dancing? You're told what to do. Yes. You know, it's explained. So in an hour, you might do six dances, seven dances, if if you are very experienced, because it takes six or seven minutes to explain to you the dance, and you do it for two or three minutes, and then you have a little pause at the end. Um, but these, like um, Anna and I did a ninety, did ninety minutes, I think, and we had. 22 dances in it right so, so so they go quite quickly it's quite aerobic you know it's yeah. it's but we just say all right we're playing the waltz and then yeah sure enough people can waltz then we say oh we're playing a scottish um the people who know how to do scottish they feel confident they get up and they do a scottish it's not hard but you just need to show people what it is before yeah. so that, that's what the workshop's about you like try and get people interested and hopefully if we can get um, enough people enthusiastic, there'll be places to play, places to dance. Yes. And it's all, it's good for you. It's good for your soul. It's not yeah. ecologically harmful. And, you know, it's, it's, it's all just brilliant from start to finish. And um, yeah. Yeah. So, so that's, that's kind of, that's my thing now. That's, <laughs> that's brilliant. For brother. about five years, actually. But yeah, yeah, there you go. Well, there we go, Rob. That's, that's great. I think that's a good note to to stop on, actually. So, so, um, <clears throat> you, I'll put some stuff in the show notes, um, you know, website or whatever you've got that we can, um, that people can sort of find out what you're doing. Because, uh, you know, what what interests me about what you're you're talking about is how important this is, like, from the point of view of health. You know whether that's just as you say, getting up and dancing, but even that thing of just learning, yeah. just learning something, is yeah, so absolutely. so important. Particularly as people get a bit older, because we don't do a lot of actual learning and memorising things. And I think that's such an important thing about being able to recall memory um, and, and keep that process going, because. Um, uh, you know, I have a my own opinion about that to do with, um, you know, people's mental health as they get older, um, being able to re learn something and recall, you know, because I've often reflected on all these ancient actors who seem to be, you know, the capacity to, you know, they're not suffering mm. from, they're not suffering from uh, uh, yeah. you know, Alzheimer's and whatever. Well, it touches there is something that... for me because the last time I actually saw my mother um, before she died was I was with um, uh, my ex-wife, Rachel, and my sons, and we went to visit her. And we basically sang, we sang most of Oliver, most of My Fair Lady, <laughs> <laughs> some stuff from The King and I and various hymns. And she joined in. She couldn't hold a conversation, but she could sing. Yeah. That's an interesting thing, isn't it? I think that's very interesting. Yeah, and, and she uh, was happy. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's wonderful. So that's, that's lovely. Right, well, 
Good to speak to you again. Good to speak and, to you, uh, Bing. And, uh, you know, at some point, hopefully, we'll catch up. Yeah, well, the, keep up the, the good world. work. Keep up and the you. good work. <laughs> and you. And you. Good on you. Speak, yeah, speak to you soon, then. Yeah. Mm-hmm.